Here's a problem from the 1983 International Mathematical Olympiad. We need to find all functions from positive real numbers to positive real numbers, satisfying these two conditions. Now, this might seem pretty abstract at first glance, but as we'll see, there's some beautiful structure lurking beneath the surface. We'll solve this step-by-step -step using strategic substitutions, and I'll also show you a completely different approach using monotonicity as a bonus at the end. Let's dive in and see what we can uncover. In functional equations like this one, strategic substitutions are your best friend. Let's start with the simplest positive real number we can think of, 1. We begin with the original equation. Let's substitute x equals 1 to see what happens. Setting x to 1 isolates the behavior of the function related to the variable y. This substitution immediately simplifies the left side. The term f of 1 is just some constant value. Let's call this constant, f of 1, by the name c. Since our function maps positive reals to positive reals, we know that c must be greater than 0. This relationship, f of f of y equals c times y, is actually a major breakthrough. It tells us the function is bijective, meaning it's both 1 to 1 and on 2. Let me show you why this is true. Now, rigor is crucial here. Let's formally show that f is both injective and surjective, and then use that insight to find the value of c. To prove injectivity or one-to-one -one behavior, we assume that f of a equals f of b for some values a and b. Now here's the key insight. We can apply the function f to both sides of this equation. Using our property that f of f of y equals c times y, we can substitute on both sides. This gives us c times a equals c times b. Since we established that c is positive, we can divide both sides by c, proving that a must equal b. Therefore, the function is injective. Next, to prove surjectivity or onto behavior, we must show that for any positive number u, there exists some t, such that f of t equals u. Let's choose y to be u divided by c. Then f of f of u over c equals u. This means we've found our t. It's f of u over c. So the function is surjective. Now, let's circle back to the original equation and substitute y equals 1. This gives f of c times x equals f of x. But here's the beautiful thing. Because we've proven f is injective, these arguments must be equal. And since x is positive, we can conclude that c equals 1. This is actually a pivotal result that changes everything. With c equals 1, our earlier findings become much more specific and powerful. The relation f of f of y equals c times y, now simplifies beautifully to f of f of y equals y. This means f is its own inverse, a special type of function mathematicians call an involution. Let's return to the original equation one last time. We can now replace y on the right side with f of f of y. This form looks very structured, doesn't it? Let's make one more clever substitution. Let z equal f of y. Since we proved f is surjective, any positive real number z can be expressed as f of y for some y. This makes our substitution valid for all positive z. And there it is. This gives us the multiplicative form of Cauchy's functional equation. Now here's something crucial. A multiplicative function isn't automatically a power function like x to the power k we need to use the problem's limit condition to prove that it must be. Here's where we get clever with a change of variables. Let's define a new function, phi of t, as the natural log of f of e to the t. This transforms multiplication into addition, a classic mathematical trick. Let's examine phi of t plus s. Using exponent rules, this becomes the log of f of e to the t times e to the s. Because f is multiplicative, we can split this into the log of f of e to the t times f of e to the s. 
and by the properties of logarithms, this separates into a sum. So phi of t plus s equals phi of t plus phi of s. This is the additive Cauchy equation. Now we use the second condition. As x approaches infinity, f of x approaches zero. For our transformed function as t approaches infinity, e to the t also goes to infinity. So phi of t approaches the log of zero, which is negative infinity. This brings us to a beautiful theorem from analysis. An additive function that's bounded on any interval must be a simple linear function. Since phi of t approaches negative infinity, it must be bounded above on some interval, say, by zero. Therefore, our function phi must be linear. So we can conclude that phi of t equals k times t for some constant k. Now we just have to transform back to our original function. Exponentiating both sides gives f of e to the t equals e to the power of k times t. Now let's substitute x for e to the t. And there you have it. This rigorously proves that our function must take the form f of x equals x to the power k. Now we combine our two rigorously derived properties to find the exact value of k. We have the involution property and the power law form. When we substitute the second into the first, this gives us x to the power of k squared equals x to the power one. For this to hold for all positive x, the exponents must be equal. This leaves just two possible values for k, one and negative one. We use the limit condition to decide between them. If k equals one, then f of x is just x, whose limit as x grows is infinity. This violates our condition. If k equals negative one, then f of x is one over x, whose limit as x grows is zero. Perfect. This is our solution. We found a single solution. Let's perform a final verification to make sure everything checks out. The only possible solution is the reciprocal function, elegant and simple. When we plug this back into the main equation, both sides match perfectly. The limit condition is satisfied. Our solution is correct and unique. Visually, the graph of this function beautifully confirms our findings. The graph of y equals 1 over x clearly shows that as x gets larger, the function's value gracefully approaches 0, satisfying our limit condition. As a bonus, here's a completely different way to prove that f of x must be a power function, this time by proving it's monotonic. Consider some number a greater than 1. Let's assume for contradiction that f of a is also greater than 1. We'll call this value b. Since f is multiplicative, f of b to the n equals f of b to the power of n. Since f of b equals f of f of a, which is a, this becomes a to the power n. As n approaches infinity, b to the n goes to infinity. But f of b to the n also goes to infinity because a is greater than one. This contradicts our condition that the limit of the function must be zero. This means our assumption was wrong. If a is greater than one, then f of a must be between zero and one. Now consider any y greater than x. We can write y as a times x for some a greater than one. Then f of y equals f of a times f of x. Since f of a is less than 1, this implies f of y is strictly less than f of x. The function is strictly decreasing. This leads to another beautiful theorem. A function that's both multiplicative and monotonic must be a power function. Having proven monotonicity, we can again conclude f of x equals x to the k, and the rest of the proof follows as before. It's a completely different path to the same rigorous conclusion. If you enjoyed seeing these ideas unfold, consider giving this video a like. And if you want to see more mathematical explorations like this one, don't forget to subscribe. As always, thank you for watching.
and I'll see you in the next video.